Thousands of strange spaceships sneak into Earth's airspace. They descend to our planet and fly through cities, plunging people into complete chaos. Suddenly, the door of the largest ship opens, and a strange creature comes out. It tries to copy our language and says they had come from a distant star Proxima Centauri. Something like this might happen because scientists have recently picked up a strange radio signal off that star. Proxima Centauri is the closest star to our solar system. It's only 4.2 light years away. That means a beam of light that starts from this star reaches Earth in 4.2 years. That's also 270,000 distances from Earth to the Sun. The star Proxima Centauri itself is too pale for us to see with the unaided eye in the night sky. But its system hides a little secret. Let's fly there and take a closer look. So here's this red dwarf. It's seven times smaller than our sun and eight times lighter. Proxima Centauri is 1.5 times bigger than Jupiter and almost 150 times heavier. But what we're looking for is a little further away. This is Proxima Centauri b, a planet similar to Earth. It's only 10% larger than Earth and is in the habitable zone of the star. It's the perfect distance, not too far away and not too close. So the temperature isn't too high or low there either. Water, if it exists on that planet, can be in a liquid state. And so, life can survive and evolve there. Maybe it's developed enough to send us the signal that we had received. A radio signal is basically waves. They have a certain frequency and length, and we can always tell an artificial signal from a naturally generated one. The signal that we picked up from Proxima Centauri B had a frequency of 982 megahertz. The regular radio we listen to in the kitchen or in the car picks up signals around 100 megahertz. That's why scientists have concluded that the signal was created artificially. Such signals could have a way of communication between the developed worlds. If this is really a message from an outer space civilian, we should be able to decode it. For this, any civilization must use the simplest method of encryption. For example, Earth has already sent a radio signal into space. It was the Arecibo message. This message consists of 1,679 digits. It's a rectangle of 23 by 73 squares that has information about our civilization encoded using a binary code. At the top of the rectangle, there's a system of numbers that we use. They're marked in white. This purple thing is the key to read the next part of the message. The atomic numbers of the elements like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus are encoded in this key. These are the key elements that can start life. If those who receive this signal can make sense of the numbers in the key, they can read the next part of the message. These green things are the building blocks of our DNA chain. And right at the bottom here is the DNA chain itself. The white rectangle indicates the number of pairs of these building blocks, and the blue spirals show the shape of a DNA chain. And then we see the human silhouette itself. The white and blue object to its left is a coded number of our average height. The human itself is drawn here at the ends of the DNA strand so that the outer space civilization can understand what we look like. And the white rectangle to the right of the human sketch is the number of Earth's population at the time of the message. That's 4.2 billion as of 1974, almost half the number we have now. The next part is a drawing of our solar system. The big yellow square is the Sun. Then come all the planets in our solar system, including Pluto. Earth has shifted up a bit here, so that outer space civilization can understand where this message is coming from. In the last drawing is the observatory from which this message had been sent into space. This signal is now on its way to the M13 star cluster 25,000 light years away from Earth. So it won't get there for another 25,000 years and we'll need another 25 to get a response if there is really someone on the other side who can receive the signal. If the signal from Proxima Centauri is also a message, we'll need time to decode it. So let's fire up our super-powered computing machine and wait for the result. But this isn't the first mystery signal we've ever picked up on Earth. Scientists recorded an unusual WOW signal in 1977. They supposed it came from somewhere in the constellation of Sagittarius. The telescope was picking up the unknown signal for an impressive 72 seconds. Later, a scientist who looked at the printout of the signal concluded that the signal was artificial. He wrote, wow, on the printout as his reaction. The following observations and studies couldn't catch this signal again. Some theories said that this signal came from a celestial spaceship flying by. It had flown away and we could no longer detect the signal. But most likely, this signal was created on Earth. 
It was directed upward but reflected off an object at a high altitude. It could have been an airplane, a satellite, or space debris orbiting our planet. Then the signal was picked up by the telescope, and because it was human-made, all of its characteristics, like wavelength and frequency, could have confused scientists. In 2017, scientists recorded a flare on Proxima Centauri. The star's brightness increased by 1,000 times in just 10 seconds. Before that, there was another flare there that was weaker but lasted about two minutes. With these flares, Proxima Centauri has emitted enormous amounts of radiation. Even if there was life on the star's companion planet, these flares would have likely destroyed it. The stellar winds would have simply blown the atmosphere off the planet and made its surface lifeless. Overall, the planet Proxima Centauri b receives 60 times more high-energy radiation and 400 times more X-ray radiation than Earth. Scientists have concluded that the probability of life here is 1 to 100 million. And while we don't know yet for sure if the signal was artificial or natural, the scenario of a bunch of spaceships coming to Earth is most likely possible. Our only method for searching for outer space civilizations is using radio waves. They're like loud noise that blasts away from our planet in different directions at the speed of light. The main problem here is the gigantic distances. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 100,000 light years wide. Suppose there's life at the other end of it. If we send a radio signal to them, it won't reach that supposed planet for another 100,000 years. And we won't get a response for another 100,000 years. It's the same if someone once wanted to contact us. We didn't learn how to create and receive radio signals until the 19th century. If a civilization was developing at the same time as us somewhere in the Milky Way and they invented the radio, we won't get their signal for several millennia. Plus, the radio noise from our planet is starting to fade away. We use Bluetooth, fiber optics, cable TV. So in about 100 years, we'll no longer be visible to other worlds. Or worse, what if there was an outer space civilization somewhere that was sending signals into space? The signals were reaching our planet, but we didn't yet have the technology to pick them up. The world that was sending the signal has evolved, and the signal went out. We could have caught those remnants of the radio waves that were moving through the universe, but we set up the antennas too late. There are about two trillion galaxies in the universe. Each of them contains billions and trillions of stars similar to our sun. Maybe there's a planet near one of them that looks like ours. Life could be blooming there. In this outer space civilization, just like us, is looking through telescopes in hopes to catch the radio signal from an unknown planet. Voyager 1, which has been traveling through interstellar space for more than 45 years and is trailing a long gray beard by this time, nah, not really. It suddenly began to send strange signals to Earth. Even more bizarre, there are no signs that the probe has broken or anything. Scientists from NASA are desperately trying to find the reason. So what's happened exactly? First of all, let me tell you a bit more about Voyager 1 and its long, long journey. Voyager 1 is an American space probe. Scientists from NASA sent it into space on September 5, 1977. Voyager's goal was to explore the outer planets of our solar system, namely Jupiter and Saturn. Initially, scientists assumed that the mission would take about five years. <laughs> the joke's on them. The probe exceeded all expectations. Not only did it fulfill its mission, but it's still working for much longer than expected. Voyager 1 has been wandering around space for more than 45 years. It's hard to estimate what Voyager 1 has done for science. Firstly, it successfully sent a lot of photos of Jupiter and Saturn to Earth. By the way, you can even check out these photos yourself. All of them are published on the NASA website. Thanks to Voyager, we also discovered several new moons of Jupiter and a previously unknown system of its rings. We learned that Jupiter's famous red spot is actually a giant superfast storm. And after leaving Neptune's orbit behind, Voyager also sent a lot of important data about interstellar plasma. So Voyager 1 successfully proved to scientists how useful it was. After that, it happily headed for its next goal, the Kuiper Belt and the heliosphere. The Kuiper Belt is a ring of icy bodies that extends from Neptune to a distance of approximately 50 AU from the Sun. It's kind of similar to the asteroid belt, but about 20 times wider and 100 times heavier. And the heliosphere is an area around the Sun where the pressure of the solar wind is balanced with the pressure of interstellar gas. 
Yeah, I know, it sounds like some hard scientific stuff. Just keep in mind that this data really helps us understand the universe as a whole. So, this is Voyager's last task, to tell us more about interstellar space. The probe has already sent us more than 60 frames for a mosaic of the solar system from a distance of over 4 billion miles from Earth. Scientists use these frames to make a big colored picture. The photo was called the pale blue dot. And you've probably already guessed what that dot is. Yep, that's what our Earth looks like through Voyager's eyes. This photo clearly shows how tiny we really are and how precious and fragile our planet is. But Voyager 1 also has another, even more important mission, to tell other civilizations about us humans. You might have heard about the famous Voyager Golden Records. People created many audio and video files and added them to these records. There are a few sections. The first one contains hello in 55 languages, including ancient and extinct ones. Almost 80% of the recordings are different musical pieces, like Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and Stravinsky. Folk music from different countries and ages, and a bit of the blues, like famous songs by Louis Armstrong and Chuck Berry. The remaining 20% of the recordings contain different human voices, sounds of nature and animals, as well as 116 images encoded as audio signals. There's also recordings of speeches by Kurt Waldheim, a former UN Secretary General, and Jimmy Carter, a former US President. These are just some friendly messages. In addition to the records, scientists also packed a needle for playing them. Don't worry, they also left a simple drawing that showed how to use all this stuff and how to translate the sounds into pictures. They added Earth's coordinates, which they created using a pulsar map. It shows the position of the Sun in the Milky Way. The record was packed in an aluminum case and covered with gold to protect it against radiation and cosmic dust. Carrying this record, Voyager 1 set off on its long journey. And it has already traveled quite a distance, I'd say. Right now, Voyager 1 is 154 astronomical units away from us. That's about 14.5 billion miles. This makes it the most remote human-made object. Initially, this title belonged to the Pioneer 10 mission, but Voyager overtook it in 1998. What a bargain for NASA! It's way beyond its Best Buy date. Voyager 1 is actually so cool that it even overtook its twin brother, Voyager 2, which, by the way, had been sent into space two weeks earlier. Voyager 1 moves at a speed of 9.7 miles per second. That's 35,000 miles per hour. Even the fastest sports car in the world travels at a speed of only 305 miles per hour. So it's hard to imagine the speed of Voyager. Anyway, at the moment, Voyager is heading to the borders of the Oort cloud. That's the name of a hypothetical layer of icy objects surrounding the solar system. Astronomers haven't confirmed its existence yet, but they're almost sure it's there. After all, even black holes were only a theory not so long ago. Unfortunately, Voyager 1 won't return back to the solar system. It'll keep in touch with Earth at least until 2025. But eventually, we'll lose the connection with it for good. In 300 years, it'll reach the borders of the Oort cloud. And in 30,000 years, I won't be around then, it'll finally leave the solar system. And if nothing happens to it along the way, in another 10,000 years, Voyager 1 will approach red dwarf star Gliese 445 in the giraffe constellation. In the future, the probe will probably keep wandering around the Milky Way galaxy. And now, let's finally discuss the mysterious signals part. So, what happened? Well, a rather unusual thing. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which monitors and controls both Voyagers, reported this problem in May 2022. Our veteran spacecraft suddenly began sending strange data to Earth. The whole situation puzzles even engineers from NASA. Now, I bet you're thinking, ah, oh, come on, the thing just probably broke down or something. But the truth is that Voyager 1 is totally fine. It works as usual, receives and carries out commands from Earth, and collects and sends scientific data. But the readings of the AACS, which stands for Attitude and Articulation Control Subsystem, don't show what is actually happening to Voyager anymore. The system supports the orientation of the probe in space and helps it keep in touch with Earth. So, basically, the signals mean that the probe's orientation in space is messed up. 
but scientists claim this is not the case. They know that the source of the antenna signal remains in the same position relative to Earth as planned. The problem hasn't triggered any of the onboard fault protection systems. The probe hasn't even entered safe mode. So what in the world, or universe, is going on? Suzanne Dodd, the head of the project, says that the problem is not actually that unexpected. After all, Voyager 1 is already 45 years old. The expert admits that what's happening to the probe remains a mystery to them. They don't know exactly where the incorrect data is coming from, and it's unclear how this will affect the operation of Voyager. She adds, though, that it's not that surprising, considering that the probe is in interstellar space. There's a very high level of radiation there. No spacecraft has ever reached that point before. Scientists from NASA say they'll keep closely monitoring the data coming from Voyager 1 until they figure out the problem. If they find it, the management team will try to fix it. Otherwise, the team will have to adapt to the new conditions. It might not be enough just to understand the problem, though. It takes as much as 20 hours and 33 minutes to receive the signal from Voyager. And it takes the same amount of time to respond to it. Well, at least the second spacecraft, Voyager 2, is totally fine. Even though it's also currently in interstellar space at a distance of 12 billion miles from Earth. Anyway, we can only wait for news and hope that the problem will be resolved. I actually wonder how much longer can Voyager 1 last? Will it be able to fly to the borders of the Oort cloud in 300 years? What do you think? I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments. Weird, unusual sounds out of nowhere are spreading all over our galaxy, constantly repeating, and it's something we've never heard before. Scientists discovered it in 2020, and it was nothing like any of the other energy signatures they ever studied. Powerful and bright radio signals occurring from time to time, mysteriously disappearing within a day. It doesn't fit the profile of any space body we know. The signal is a bit irritating, and it disappears without a schedule. When scientists tried to match the signal with some other telescopes, it was gone. Low-mass stars sometimes flare up with radio energy, but not here, since they mostly have X-ray counterparts. Very dense collapsed stars, like pulsars and magnetars, are also not a choice. The closest solution they got is a mysterious class of objects we know as the Galactic Center Radio Source, GCRT. It's a radio source that brightens and rapidly glows. It decays near the center of our galaxy and could help us unravel the mysteries of the universe. If you had a flying car that could go up at a speed of 60 miles per hour, you'd only need one hour to get into space. The moon is a little bit farther, 250,000 miles, which is about 10 times the circumference of our planet. That means a moon trip would be like taking a tour around the globe and doing it 10 times straight, which would take less than six months. A trip to Pluto would take over 800 years. Proxima b is the closest Earth-like neighbor we have. It's a small rocky world that orbits the closest stellar neighbor of our Sun. It orbits the star's habitable zone, an area that's far enough from any star to have moderate conditions, not too cold and not too hot for liquid water to at least hypothetically exist. If you tried to travel to Proxima b at a speed of 25,000 miles per hour, which is the speed of the Apollo moon rockets, it would take you over 112,000 years to get there. You might not be able to breathe there. No one knows if Proxima b has an atmosphere. Humans explore the universe all the time, but we can only see around 5% of the matter up there. And Albert Einstein was the first one that realized the empty space is not really nothing. The rest we can't see is actually made up of invisible matter, also known as dark matter. It's about 27%. Combined with something called dark energy, which is 68%. If you try to pour water into space, of course, outside of a spacecraft, it would immediately boil away or vaporize. That's because there's no air or air pressure in space. As air pressure lowers, the temperature you'd usually need to boil water at also gets lower, 
keeping that in mind, water boils way faster on a mountaintop than, for example, at sea level. There's no air pressure in space, so water could boil at a very low temperature. Scientists believe that there are at least a couple of billion galaxies out there. We don't know the real number, and probably never will, but they tried to calculate it by counting how many galaxies we can see in a pretty small and restricted area of the sky. It may seem as if the universe was filled with stars and a couple of planets here and there, but our home galaxy has at least 100 billion planets. If you fill a balloon with helium and release it, you'll notice it floats very high. It'll go up into the atmosphere, but it won't go into outer space. The higher you go, the thinner the air in our atmosphere gets. Your balloon will rise up until the point where the atmosphere surrounding it has the same weight as the helium inside it. That will happen at approximately a height of 20 miles above the surface. So this is as far as a helium balloon can rise. We don't really know how big the universe is. We can't see its edges, nor do we know if it even has an edge. We use technology to see out to a distance of around 14 billion light years from our planet. This means we can see around 28 billion light years in diameter across, starting with the outermost layer of our atmosphere that ends at around 600 miles above our planet's surface. Although the size of the universe is constantly changing and gets bigger through time. Mercury is closest to the sun, so most people think it's the hottest planet too. Still, Venus is the hottest planet. It's the second planet away from our central star, around 30 million miles farther from the sun compared to Mercury. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, which is like some sort of a warming blanket that helps maintain the heat coming from the sun. Venus has an unexpectedly thick atmosphere, around 100 times thicker than the one we have. Its atmosphere doesn't let the heat out, it just keeps it and constantly makes Venus hotter and hotter. Also, it mostly consists of carbon dioxide that freely lets solar energy in. But it's less transparent to lose long wavelength radiations that the warm heated surface emits. The average temperature there is around 875 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt tin. The maximum temperature on its neighbor, Mercury, is 800 degrees Fahrenheit. In maybe two or more billion years, it will be way too hot for life to exist on our precious planet. As the hundreds of millions of years go by, our sun will keep getting hotter and brighter. Eventually, temperatures will be so high, our beautiful oceans will be wiped away. Since they produce 70% of the oxygen we need to survive, there will be no life without them. All of this means that our planet will simply become a vast desert something like Mars is today. Pluto, a very distant used-to-be planet, now dwarf planet, is actually smaller in diameter than the entire US. The biggest distance there, from Maine to Northern California, is approximately 2,900 miles, while Pluto is only 1,473 miles across. Pluto is very far, but the edge of our solar system is 1,000 times farther away than this dwarf planet. But astronomers found many space objects orbiting our Sun way farther than Pluto, such as Kuiper Belt objects and trans-Neptunian objects. There's also an Oort comet cloud that goes half a light year from Pluto, also 1,000 times farther. A neutron star is really heavy. Just a teaspoon filled with it would weigh 6 billion tons. Neutron stars are something that remain from huge stars that have run out of fuel. The fading star explodes, and its core falls apart, but, due to gravity, it forms an extremely dense neutron star. These stars typically have a mass of up to three suns, but the radius there is around six miles, because this is one of the densest things in our universe, at least that we know about. The universe has a color, and it averages to be some kind of beige, or as they call it, cosmic latte. It also has its own smell that reminds you of seared steak or hot metal. At least, that's something astronauts floating in space have said. If you want to build a spacesuit, get ready to work really hard. It takes 5,000 hours to make it and will cost you a million dollars. A really good one will have 11 layers of material and weighs about 110 pounds. And it needs to be comfortable. 
You'll need more space in there, because you grow up to 2 inches when in space. When you're floating around in space, Earth's gravity doesn't have any impact on you. That's why the vertebrae in your spine might expand and relax a little bit, which means you'll be maybe 3% taller. For 6 feet, it's about 2 extra inches. Oh, don't worry, it's not permanent. As soon as you go down to Earth, you'll shrink back down to your normal size within a couple of months. Space isn't the best option if you want to have a conversation with your friend. Because up there, sound doesn't travel at all. Molecules there are so far apart that sound vibrations can't reach them, which automatically means they can't vibrate, so we can't hear them. Movies are not accurate with this. No one could hear you screaming in space, too. We kind of live inside our sun. The sun is not just that big hot ball of light located 93 million miles away from us. Its outer atmosphere is way bigger. It extends far beyond the surface we can see. Our planet's orbit goes through its tenuous atmosphere. The evidence is when gusts of the solar wind generate the southern and northern lights. That means, in some way, we live inside the sun. Not just us, other planets too, including distant Neptune. The heliosphere, which is what we call the outer solar atmosphere, extends to about 10 billion miles. Hey, wake up! Quick, listen to that. It's a 5-second FM signal coming from one of Jupiter's moons. You fumble for your phone and inform your colleagues. They freak out over the news and rush to the lab. You've been a scientist working with the Juno probe, exploring Jupiter for years. But this is the first time you've witnessed something so unusual. Ganymede is Jupiter's largest moon and the biggest moon in our solar system. If this space body didn't orbit around Jupiter, it would be classified as a planet. It's even bigger than Mercury and Pluto. What makes this moon stand out among others is the fact that it has its own magnetic field. The moon was born around 4.5 billion years ago. It means it's as old as Jupiter itself. This planet-sized space body takes 7 Earth days to orbit its planet. Everyone gathers at the laboratory, impatiently waiting for you to play the recording of the signal coming from space. Your colleagues get their game on, trying to figure out what the source of this mysterious sound is. Around 40% of Ganymede's surface is dark, with craters scattered around. And 60% is light-colored. There are formations that were probably caused by tectonic activity or the release of water from under the surface. Scientists managed to discover a thin layer of oxygen trapped in the Moon's atmosphere. The temperatures there are super low, between minus 170 to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. There isn't much information about how the Moon behaves or what chemical elements it hides inside. Some of your colleagues try to create the same conditions that existed when the sound was transmitted. For hours, they sit there waiting, but nothing. Maybe it was a fluke. You get to the control system and activate the Juno spacecraft. The main point of this mission is to observe Jupiter's gravity, magnetic fields, the atmosphere, and the planet's evolution. By the way, there's also some evidence that Jupiter's largest moon is evolving too. Since it has a magnetic field surrounding it, auroras pop up all the time. Those are glowing gas circling the moon's north and south poles. If life existed in such a place, it would probably be at the bottom of Ganymede's extremely salty ocean. For a long time, scientists thought that the sun was a crucial component to kickstart life. But now we know that there are organisms dwelling deep at the bottom of the oceans. Those are doing just fine without sunlight. The oceans of our planet are teeming with some of the most bizarre creatures of all shapes and sizes. Sea lilies live some 10,000 feet underwater. They got their name because they look like flowers. Except they're not plants, but animals. Don't be fooled by their stems and leaves. Those are body parts equipped with nerve endings to detect food around them. Goblin sharks are probably some of the most weird-looking sharks that live at the bottom of the ocean. They can grow up to 12 feet long and have a very unusual snout. Now take a look at the anglerfish. It has a bioluminescent blob on its head to attract prey and navigate its way around the dark ocean floor. It's a natural flashlight that never needs new batteries. It's only the females that have these flashlights, though. The blobfish is another bizarre animal living down there. 
It lives in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, 9,000 feet under the surface. Anyway, even though you asked everyone to keep the news confidential, it somehow leaks to the media and becomes a new trending topic. You get a call from a news agency. They say they want to interview you about this breakthrough that may prove life exists in outer space. The next day, you head down to the news station to talk about your discovery. You have a whole live studio audience watching your every move as you reach out to grab your glass of water. The crew scurries around doing some last-minute checkups before you're live on air. The makeup artist does some final brush-ups. The sound engineer asks you to test your mic once more. Several of the producers are sitting in the front seats. Bright lights are flooding the studio. The countdown begins. 3, 2, 1, and… You're introduced, and the host asks you to explain what it was that you heard. You tell them about the Juno space probe orbiting Jupiter. After a couple of questions, the host finally brings up the most dreaded one. Might the mysterious sound be coming from another civilization? Everyone leans in, waiting for you to answer. You freeze, not knowing what to say. Even though the crushing pressure at the bottom of the ocean is a thousand times stronger than at sea level, life still exists there. Algae, which is considered a delicacy in the ocean world, is off-menu for deep-sea creatures due to a lack of sunlight. Many of these bottom dwellers have to munch on leftovers instead. Those sink down there from the upper layers of the ocean. The freezing temperatures and the intense pressure have altered the cells of these creatures. This has made them more resilient than the average fish. Bacteria were developing their own ways of surviving. Studies show that they feed on certain gases and chemicals, like sulfur and carbon dioxide. Methane and hydrogen are released when tectonic plates move against each other. And some of these bacteria feast upon those gases too. Tardigrades, also known as water bears, are microscopic critters that can live and thrive in extreme conditions. You can find them in volcanoes, frozen glaciers, and even in the empty void of space. Which means that some life forms might actually exist on Ganymede. You explain this to your audience. Then you mention that you don't have enough information to determine if it was another civilization or a natural phenomenon that produced the sound. This doesn't mean that the bottom of Ganymede's freezing oceans isn't teeming with its own bizarre and weird creatures. There might be some legendary beasts like the Kraken or Leviathan there. Or weird glowing fish with two heads. A fish with tentacles and a large fin. Giant crabs. The bacteria there might be as varied as our own. The plants, if they exist there, have to be strong enough to survive the sub-zero temperatures. The animals on Jupiter's largest moon could be as big as our blue whales or as tiny as plankton. After the interview, you head back to the lab to examine the records once more. On your way home, you see posters of yourself with captions like, Are we not alone? Hey, you've become a celebrity! Many people take pictures of you. You've been booked by other agencies for more interviews. Some science magazines even want to put you on the front cover as the person of the year. Every time you come to work, you wait for the sound to appear again. But nothing. You send a signal from the Juno probe, trying to make some sort of contact with whatever produced the sound. Nothing. That night, you pass out on your desk once more. Eureka moment wakes you up in the middle of the night. There might be something you've missed. You run the numbers again and realize that the answer was in front of you this whole time. It wasn't another civilization that produced this sound. The source was electrons. Every planet produces its own sound. It's created when charged particles from the solar wind and the planet's magnetosphere interact with one another. That's what happened on Ganymede. The electrons in its magnetic field, where the probe picked up the signal, were acting stranger than usual, and this amplified some irregular frequencies. You're embarrassed and spend the rest of your night making phone calls, telling your team the news. The agency that interviewed you releases a statement. They explain that other civilizations aren't trying to contact us. You sit back at your desk, waiting for the next big thing to happen. Europa is another of Jupiter's moons that may host life. It's made up of an iron core, a mantle, and a salty ocean, twice the volume of all the oceans on Earth. And just like Ganymede, the ocean lies under a water ice crust. Scientists claim that there might even be active volcanoes there, and some resilient bacteria may live there. 
With enough water, certain chemicals, and a source of energy, Europa could produce life. But it's unlikely that we'll find anything but tiny microbes. No one will hear your cry in space, or something like that. We've all heard this famous chilling phrase, and it's actually true. Space, for the most part, consists of a giant nothingness. There's a lot of, you know, space in space. But this doesn't mean there are no sounds in space. In fact, there are plenty of them. And some of them can even make you shiver. Let's take a look at the scariest space sounds. First of all, how are cosmic sounds even recorded? Sound is just the vibration of molecules. When you scream, you make the molecules push each other furiously until they reach the ear of the person you're yelling at. Then these vibrations get transmitted to the brain, and we recognize them as something that you might need to apologize for. In other words, to hear something, we need molecules. And that's where things get complicated. There aren't any of them in space. The entire universe almost completely consists of a vacuum. No, not a hoover. Absolute nothingness. However, the wizards from NASA still record space sound somehow. So how do they do it? The thing is, there are some types of waves that don't care about molecules. We regular folk can't perceive them without some special devices. These waves include, for example, radio waves. We'll need a radio or something like that to recognize them. And that's exactly what NASA's satellites do. They catch random radio waves. Thanks to their heroism, we can find out how different cosmic bodies sound. These satellites record a variety of waves, fluctuations of plasmas, magnetic fields, and other, you know, stuff. And then scientists from NASA transform all this into normal soundtracks. And some of them sound quite frightening, to put it mildly. Let's take our magnetic field, for example. It surrounds our planet like an invisible shield, protecting us from all sorts of nasties, like radiation and solar winds. At the same time, we can neither see it, feel it, nor hear. Oops. Well, the last one is outdated. Scientists from the Technical University of Denmark took magnetic waves recorded by the ESA swarm satellite. They converted them into an audio track and got a pretty creepy result. Now, to be honest, it sounds more like an eerie entity stalking you in the middle of the night. And if you remember the maps of Earth's magnetic field, it starts to feel like a spider crawling nearby. Ew. And this isn't the first strange sound that we caught on Earth. Recently, we caught another weird radio emission from space. Scientists found out that the repeating signal came from somewhere very far away, like billions of light years away from us. Such fast radio bursts usually lasted no longer than a few milliseconds, but this one was unique. It lasted about three seconds, basically thousands of times longer than usual. And at the same time, the signal was very precise, so much so that scientists even compared it to a heartbeat. Scientists believe that this signal is caused by pulsars, or neutron stars. One time, Nikola Tesla caught something similar. But unfortunately, at that time, we didn't know about such things as pulsars. So Tesla was sure that he had caught a message from some extraterrestrial life. It's a pity that the truth turned out to be much more boring. But let's move on from the Earth to the Moon. In 1969, the astronauts of the Apollo 10 mission, the spacecraft that made the final test flight to the Moon, flew past its surface. And then they caught some strange signals coming from the dark side of the Moon, the side that we never see because the Moon is tidally locked to us. The sound was so weird that the astronauts weren't even sure whether to report it to NASA. They were afraid they wouldn't be taken seriously and maybe even not allowed to participate in the next space missions. Here's what it sounded like. But according to NASA, it's not some creepy extraterrestrial music at all. These may just be some radio waves that affected each other because of their proximity. Although the astronauts who heard it for the first time probably felt a little creeped out. Let's move to the other planets. Now, 40 years ago, scientists actively explored the surface of Venus. They sent as many as 10 probes there, which were supposed to capture audio and video shooting from the surface. Now we know what Venus, which could easily destroy us at any attempt to even get close to it, sounds like. Horrifying. And you wouldn't expect anything else from the most dangerous planet in the solar system. 
Unfortunately, Venus is even more toxic than the average Twitter user. <laughs> so these probes didn't last too long. They heroically arrived on a planet and soon broke down. Next one is Jupiter. This space giant, which is 11 times larger than the Earth, never fails to scare us. One of NASA's probes, Juno, flies around Jupiter every few weeks. The probe is moving at a tremendous speed, 130,000 miles per hour. One day, Juno caught one of the strongest invisible signals it had ever encountered. This was the point at which the mad solar wind came into conflict with the magnetic field of Jupiter. It kind of sounded like a cosmic boom. The original sound lasted two hours, but it was compressed to a few seconds. It actually sounds more like a collision of a sea wave and a rock. But here, in terms of horror, Jupiter surprisingly loses to one of its small moons, Ganymede. In 2021, the Galileo space probe flew past Ganymede, and during its flight, it received a rather strange recording. These sounds are satellite radiation. And it's unclear whether it sounds like a cozy sunny day in the jungle or like thousands of bats waiting for you in the night. Next one is Saturn. This signal was caught by the Cassini-Huygens Automatic Interplanetary Station, which was launched into space in 1997. When flying past Saturn, Cassini recorded a pretty scary sound. This terrifying cry of thousands of souls is actually just some radio waves. They aren't too different from what the auroras emit on Earth. A little later, Cassini received another recording. The sounds made by lightning and thunderstorms on Saturn. They sound pretty interesting, too. More like popping corn or a Geiger counter, right? But that's just because these lightning strikes have a crazy frequency. Moving on from the solar system to outer space. The famous Voyager 1 was launched back in 1977 and continues to send us data even 40 years after its launch. In 2012, it left the solar system and entered interstellar space. And then, while abandoning its home, Voyager 1 detected the sound of plasma waves. The original recording lasted seven months. But fortunately, scientists felt sorry for us and reduced it to 12 seconds. It isn't really eerie, but is still kind of unsettling. And although it feels like nothing can beat Saturn's horrors, let's end this tournament with one of the scariest objects in the universe, a black hole. This sound was recorded by the Chandra Space Telescope. While studying a cluster of galaxies in the constellation Perseus, they discovered something strange. Some undulating movements appear from the center of the cluster. They spread out in all directions, like circles on the water. Scientists have suggested that this was caused by a supermassive black hole. The thing is, black holes don't always devour space objects entirely. Sometimes they kind of spit them out. This causes vibrations of gases, which we can convert into soundtracks. What's interesting is that the oscillation of each such wave actually lasts about 10 million years. You're just listening to a very accelerated recording. Scientists have reduced the delay between oscillations by about 144 quadrillion times. So, let's check it out. This is probably the eeriest sound from the whole list. Nothing too loud or wild, but there's something dark and disturbing about it. Now, those were the scariest space sounds captured by NASA. To be fair, most of them sounded creepy simply because they're radio waves. But it's still fun to get spooked sometimes. Ever wondered what it would be like to hear the sound of a black hole? <laughs> NASA's got you covered. Here is a screaming black hole. Screaming, screaming in space? In space? <laughs> I, thought in space, I thought in space no, space, no, one, space, can no one can hear you can scream. scream. Well, let me explain. Using a telescope, NASA examined the movements of hot gas in a cluster of galaxies in 2002. Then they converted what they found into a sonification. The sound, mm, how can I put it politely, wasn't appealing, but that's okay. After all, you're able to hear the noise hot gas produces in a cluster of galaxies 250 million light years away. Hey, how would you like to hear the sound gas produces right here on Earth? Yeah, never mind. Sound waves already existed over there in the gas cluster, so experts just rescaled them to the range of human hearing. This is how they converted the input coming from the telescope. The principle is universal. 
In our atmosphere, we can hear stuff because pressure waves move through a medium like liquid or gas. Sound waves in these galaxies can also move because they're surrounded by gas. What does it have to do with black holes? Well, the thing triggering those pressure waves in the cluster is a giant black hole. To be more precise, it's a supermassive black hole that weighs millions of times more than the Sun. Wow! Experts still don't fully understand the relationship between supermassive black holes and the clusters surrounding them. They only know that these two evolve together. They're interrelated. The cluster feeds the black hole with new material and so on. And in return, the black hole heats the cluster. That's all we know. Now, this made me wonder how large the biggest black holes are. There are four types of black holes. Stellar, intermediate, supermassive, and miniature. Naturally, the biggest ones fall into the category of supermassive. The largest black hole in the universe we've discovered so far is about 66 billion times larger than the Sun. It's one of the brightest objects in the universe. Astronomers keep scanning space and finding new black holes. But have you wondered when the first black hole was spotted? It was discovered by different researchers independently in 1971. Scientists first confirmed that these objects were formed from the remnants of massive stars. After a black hole appeared, it then consumed all the nearby objects. Here is a quick recap of how these space objects work. Their gravitational force is super strong. Nothing can escape a black hole after crossing the event horizon. Black holes eat everything, hey, just like me. <laughs> I mean, even light gets trapped inside them. What's even cooler slash scarier is that the laws of time and space become distorted there. If you were falling into a black hole, you would realize that time slows down there. Einstein explains this in his famous general relativity theory. In very, very basic terms, time gets affected by how fast you are moving at extreme speeds. NASA has discovered a rapidly growing black hole. But don't worry, the world isn't in danger. This black hole has been in front of the eyes of astronomers this whole time. It's in a region of a well-studied sky field. Astronomers say that this hole formed 750 million years after the Big Bang. You know, the birth of our universe. So why are black holes so bright? Well, that's a bit ironic. When I defined the space phenomenon, I said that black holes were so dense that even light got trapped there. But ask any astrophysicist, and they'll confirm that black holes are among the brightest objects in space. That's because black holes don't exist alone. They sit at the centers of galaxies and are usually surrounded by clouds of hot gas. And these clouds create cosmic auroras around black holes. I must mention, though, that you can't see a black hole directly. What you see is actually the effects it has on its environment. For instance, you can see space objects being ripped apart by a black hole. Remember when the first time ever silhouette image of a black hole was shared with the public in 2019? Proof, you fellas! You wouldn't really see the black hole if there was no orange ring. Why is the ring orange and not green or purple? The dark shadow inside is the shadow of the black hole. The glowing orange of the bright ring in the image isn't the real hue of the gas. I'm a little heartbroken here. It's a representation picked by researchers to depict the brightness of the emissions. A scientist explained that yellow is the most intense emission, red is less intense, and black has little or no emission at all. In the optical range, this ring would likely seem white, perhaps tinged with blue or red. Now, spaghettification is a real word. That's an astonishing ability black holes have. If a giraffe fell into a black hole, it would stretch into a long, spaghetti-like strand. On Earth, the giraffe's legs are closer to the center of Earth, so they're more powerfully attracted to the surface than the animal's head. This rule works in the animal's favor on Earth, but would work against it inside a black hole. In a black hole, there's extreme gravity. The closer the giraffe's legs got to the center of the black hole, the more the pull of gravity would stretch them. And the closer to the center the giraffe got, the faster its legs would move. But the top half of the giraffe's body would be farther away, so it wouldn't move toward the center as fast as the legs. Here comes the spaghettification. Can we have meatballs with that? No? Okay. The only difference between a black hole and our sun is that the center of the hole is made of super-dense material. 
It provides the black hole with a strong gravitational field that can trap everything, including light. This is why we can't see black holes. Did you know that, theoretically, you could turn anything into a black hole? For instance, if you shrank the sun to approximately 4 miles across, you would compress the matter inside to an extremely small size. This would make it so dense that our star would turn into a black hole. You could do the same with a planet or even your own body. Is there something called a white hole, or is it just a myth? White holes exist, in theory. Hypothetically, they function in the opposite way to black holes. Nothing can enter them. Physicists think of black and white holes as yin and yang, or two sides of the same coin. For them, a white hole looks exactly like a black hole, which makes different things come out of it. But the existence of white holes hasn't been proven yet. And how about wormholes? There are so many movies about black holes and wormholes. How many of them are based on reality, and how much is fiction? Some people believe that black holes function like wormholes. You go inside and exit in another part of the universe. Since we still have a lot to learn and discover about physics, no one can prove this theory is wrong or right. Astrophysics says, We need to have a solid theory that unifies general relativity with quantum mechanics. Black holes are among the largest structures in the universe, but there might be tiny specimens. The mass of the smallest black hole we know about is only three times greater than that of our sun. Now apparently, black holes can vanish. Stephen Hawking developed a theory of Hawking radiation. According to it, radiation decreases the mass and rotational energy of black holes. And ultimately, they evaporate. This process occurs very slowly, though, if we're not talking about small black holes. Astronomers have discovered an elusive black hole in the neighboring galaxy. What makes this one special is the fact that it's the first dormant stellar black hole outside of our galaxy. This type of black hole is hard to observe because such holes don't interact much with their environment. They don't emit as much radiation as other black holes. Well, back on Earth, what about sinkholes? Well, different physics. Yet, if you cross the event horizon, your whole car can disappear. Whoops! The ground shakes and you hear a loud cracking sound. Oh no! The dome is failing! Everyone runs to their escape pods to evacuate. People are pushing and shoving. The Earth-like atmosphere in the dome is going to be compromised, and you'll be exposed to the thin elements on the surface of Mars. Everyone rushes to put their helmets on. The crack is getting bigger by the second, and people are panicking, trying to get on the escape shuttles as quickly as possible. In the chaos, they all jam into the wrong ships, and there isn't any room for you. Red warning lights begin to flash in the dome, and a voice rings out, telling everyone to put their helmets on. The Martian atmosphere is only minutes away from rushing in, and humans won't be able to breathe otherwise. This is just your luck. You only just arrived on Mars. As the ships zoom off into the distance, you wonder what you should do. You call out for help, but no one answers. Suddenly, a robot guide rolls up behind you, and you hear a faint noise coming from its speakers. It says, no one can hear you because the atmosphere on Mars is so much less dense than on Earth. It also has a lot of carbon dioxide, which absorbs sound waves. Even if a loud concert was happening just 30 feet away, it would sound like it was miles away. Would you like me to assist you with anything? You ask it for help, and it shows you a 3D layout of the entire dome. You can see a few other shuttle stations, so you decide to aim for them. Unfortunately, you're going to need to get to the opposite side of the dome to reach another shuttle station. Just as you begin to panic and wonder how you could get there, the robot transforms into a bike and tells you to hop on. You get in and cruise through the city, looking at all the empty buildings and streets. The crack is getting even bigger, and tiny pieces of the dome begin to fall from above, like snow. When you arrive at the other station, the last few people are boarding the only shuttle. You chase after them, desperately trying to get their attention. As you ding the bell on your bike, though, it barely makes any noise at all. Their ship pulls away before they can notice you. You ask why sounds aren't working, and the robot explains that you can barely hear high-pitched noises on Mars. The carbon dioxide makes high-pitched noises, like bells and chirping birds, almost impossible to hear. If only you were still on Earth, they might have noticed you. The robot tells you that there's one last chance to escape. He transforms into a tiny spaceship. 
You get in, and he flies through the crack in the dome out into space. It's going so fast that you should be back on Earth before long. Just as you're starting to relax and enjoy the sights of space, you see a red light flashing on the robot. You ask it what's wrong, but you get no response. Suddenly, you realize that you can't hear anything in space. Sound travels in waves, and it needs something to move through, like air or water. Space is a vacuum with no air, so you can't hear any sounds at all. The spaceship suddenly changes direction and blasts off away from Earth. You try to steer the robot in the right direction, but you can't figure out how to get its attention. The ship charts a flight all the way to Venus. As you get closer, the turbulence kicks in. Venus has winds faster than any tornado on Earth. You keep getting swept away, trying to find a safe space to land in. The robot manages to keep a steady course, despite the wind throwing it all over the place. You can already feel the heat through all the layers. Finally, the robot spots a small cave in the distance and attempts to land there. As soon as the robot touches ground, it morphs into a spacesuit you can wear, so you're safe in the extreme environment. Today's forecast in Venus? Heat. Extremely boiling temperatures all day and night. Expect clouds of sulfuric acid and gale force winds. The atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide, so you can expect your voice to drop deeper too because of the planet's dense atmosphere. It's only the second planet closest to the sun, but it's actually the hottest. Its atmosphere traps the heat from the sun and keeps it around the planet. It's actually so hot on Venus that it could melt lead. If you were cruising by with the spaceship, the whole thing would melt in a matter of minutes. Luckily, you have this indestructible robot armor. You try to ask the robot how to get back, and your voice sounds crazy. Your vocal cords vibrate slower here than on Earth, which makes the pitch lower. But at the same time, the speed of sound on Venus is a lot faster, making it more squeaky. Then, the high carbon dioxide content in the air creates a weird effect that tricks your brain into thinking that the sound source is small. Overall, you sound something like a cartoon duck. You look out across the horizon and see many hills and mountains scattered across the plain. But the robot tells you that many of these are volcanoes. Venus actually has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. Scientists discover more than 1,600 only on the surface, which could mean there are even more than that still undiscovered. Yeah, maybe being here all day isn't such a good idea. And not just because of the heat. A single day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days. In fact, a day on Venus is longer than a year, because it only takes 225 days for it to complete a rotation around the Sun. It's hard to understand each other, but you eventually manage. The robot tells you that it just got lost, and that you'll be back on Earth in no time. While walking around the cave, you realize that you're actually inside a volcano. You tell the robot to hurry up and get you back home before it erupts. It's clearly not very good at navigating space, though, because it's not long before you end up somewhere else. You're now on Titan, Saturn's largest moon. The moon is so large that it's even bigger than Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. The spaceship arrives in the atmosphere, which feels and behaves similar to Earth's. The only noticeable difference is the orangey haze hanging in the air, which makes it a lot more difficult to see. As you descend towards the moon, the robot detects signs of cyanide gas all over the surface and fluffy clouds made out of iced methane. You land on a soft spot and set about trying to get the robot to take you back to the right place. At least this time, you're not sweating. The robot transforms again and begins to scan the surroundings. The atmosphere is around 60% thicker than on Earth. Walking around feels like you're wading through maple syrup. There is a really high nitrogen content in the air, so things sound surprisingly similar to how they do on Earth. You tell the robot you really want to get home now but it comes out as a loud, raspy shout. This is because Titan has more nitrogen than Earth, and because sound travels a bit slower. Luckily, you can still understand each other here. The robot tells you that it needs to absorb a bit more energy from its solar panels before taking off, so you have a look around. This moon is one of the only things in the solar system that has fixed bodies of liquid like rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. You can understand why the robot got lost now, given how similar Titan is to Earth. Titan even has liquid cycles, with rain, evaporation, and condensation. This isn't water, like back on Earth, though. 
the main liquid here is methane. Scientists think that there may be volcanic activity, but instead of molten hot lava spewing out, it's water. Other planets, like Mars, have ice on the peaks of their mountains and evidence of water beneath the surface, but nothing is as close to Earth as Titan. Some scientists believe that this moon could be our next home billions of years from now. The sun's temperature will increase by then, making the Earth's atmosphere uninhabitable. By then, Titan's cool temperatures will be good enough to create stable oceans and sustain life. The robot finally gathers enough electricity to fly away, so you can head home. It'll be nice to have a normal conversation where your voice doesn't sound like an exaggerated cartoon. Whew. For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds. Some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu, or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over seven minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. 
The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades, but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or, Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started but not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. 
And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. Recently, the James Webb Space Telescope has unearthed a mysterious ancient galaxy. And it might completely change our understanding of the nature of dark matter and the process of galaxy formation. The telescope has managed to spot a stellar population bigger than our home Milky Way galaxy from 11 billion years ago. And it shouldn't actually exist. This galaxy is massive and is home to extremely old stars. They formed in the early universe. The problem is that this new observation upends our current cosmological models since, by the time of the galaxy's birth, not enough dark matter had built up to seed such a formation. Researchers have been chasing this particular galaxy for seven years. They spent endless hours observing it with the help of the two largest telescopes on our planet to figure out how old it was. Unfortunately, it was too faint and too red, so no one could measure it. Only after scientists moved their observations to space and started using the James Webb Telescope did they manage to confirm the nature of the galaxy. The thing is, unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which orbits around Earth, James Webb moves around the Sun one million miles away from Earth. That's why it made it possible to see the galaxy clearer. Previously, astronomers were sure that in early cosmic times, there were very few huge galaxies. But recent findings challenge these theoretical models. Extremely massive, dormant galaxies have been discovered as early as one to two billion years after the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. The scientists who led the spectral analysis of the James Webb Telescope data said that they were doing everything possible to confirm the oldest galaxies that existed deep in the universe. When they did, it pushed the boundaries of the current understanding of how galaxies form and evolve. And now, the main question is, how they managed to form so fast in the early universe, and what enigmatic mechanisms made them stop forming stars all of a sudden while the rest of the universe was still doing so. Galaxy formation is largely dictated by the concentration of dark matter. You see, around 84% of matter in the universe doesn't emit or absorb light. Astronomers call this stuff, which can neither be seen directly nor detected by indirect means, dark matter. It supposedly affects visible matter, radiation, and the very structure of the universe. Finding extremely massive galaxies so early in the universe is posing serious challenges to our standard model of cosmology. All because astronomers don't think that such monstrous dark matter structures as the ones hosting those massive galaxies had enough time to form. Researchers need more time to figure out how common such ancient galaxies are and how massive they can be. But if they manage to find more of those, it will really upset our ideas of galaxy formation. But it could improve our understanding of the physics of dark matter. Bizarre ancient galaxies aren't the only thing discovered thanks to James Webb. For example, Scientists have long suspected that supermassive black holes could have existed in the early universe. And this theory has been proven only thanks to the JWST and its infrared eye. It showed that an ancient black hole within galaxy Sears 1019 was actively munching on all the matter it could lay its hands on. This hole is from the times when our universe was less than 600 million years old. And that's another mystery we're yet to crack. It's supposed to take way longer than 600 million years for a supermassive black hole to grow to its full potential. Astronomers were watching the galaxy hosting the unusually old black hole as part of the Cosmic Evolution Early Release Science Survey. They saw the galaxy as it was when our 13.8 billion year old universe was just 570 million years old. Besides the ancient black hole, scientists spotted two other ones. Those probably appeared 1 and 1.1 billion years after the Big Bang. They also discovered 11 ancient galaxies that existed between 470 and 675 million years after the beginning of cosmic history. Brace yourself. You're about to hear one of the most unusual sounds ever. It's come from space, and it's the sound of two black holes colliding. But first things first. Our ears are designed in a special way which helps us translate sound waves. But these sound waves become mute once the medium they're traveling through comes to an end. It happens when, for example, the atmosphere of Earth gives way to the vastness and emptiness of the cosmos. At the same time, there are some sound waves that can move even through a vacuum. And we can translate these vacuum-friendly waves into sounds our human ears can hear. That's kind of like radio transmissions work. 
Over the past few decades, people have sent quite many satellites to the far reaches of the solar system and even beyond. These spacecraft are equipped with sensors designed to hear such things as radio and plasma waves flowing freely through interplanetary space. These instruments are crucial for research and communication reasons. An additional bonus is that now we can finally hear different kinds of space waves as audible sounds. The results are often ear-splitting sounds, and sometimes audios are downright scary. Usually, when two black holes collide, they don't produce a sound. And still, thanks to modern technologies, we can now listen to this terrifying cosmic event. Do you hear it? This chirping sound is the sound that two black holes produced while slamming into each other around a billion light years away from our planet. Interestingly, the tone of the sound rises when the holes spiral closer to each other and stops abruptly when they eventually merge. Now, do you hear that long, low buildup? It means that the merger is quite slow, more sedate, and the black holes taking part in this event are relatively lightweight. A more abrupt chirp is a sign of a fast merger, where the black holes are rather large. For example, the pair that produced this sound combined and created one black hole more than 80 times the mass of the sun. Since each of these black holes weighed as much as several stars, they were hefty enough to produce waves while passing through space. I mean gravitational waves. They are undulations in the fabric of space-time, fanning outward at the speed of light. You can probably compare them to the ripples that appear on the surface of a pond after you throw a rock in the water. Naturally, the sound of black holes colliding isn't the only unusual noise recorded by our equipment. NASA's Juno probe passes by Jupiter every few weeks at a speed of up to 130 miles per hour and plows through all kinds of invisible fields in the process. And one of the most powerful signals it has recorded is Jupiter's bow shock. That's the point where the planet's magnetic field pushes against the incoming wind of solar particles. The sound produced during this standoff sounds similar to a sonic boom. Or this sound. It was produced by the Stardust space probe when it was passing through the dust left by comet Temple 1. In the process, debris hit the body of the spacecraft. It sounded as if some creature was rapping at the window or hurrying across a hard floor. Let's have a look at NASA's nuclear-powered Cassini spaceship. It spent 13 years exploring gas giant Saturn and its numerous potentially habitable moons. This mysterious and a bit spooky sound is actually radio waves emitted by the massive planet. Such waves are caused by a phenomenon which is similar to the one producing auroras on Earth. Speaking of our own planet, it's surrounded by plasma. It consists of hot, ionized particles generated by sunlight. They're constantly slamming into Earth's atmosphere. NASA's polar mission, which was launched a few decades ago, managed to record this breath-like hiss. That's what plasma orbiting our planet sounds like. As for these weird sounds, NASA doesn't say which space probe recorded them, but they're coming from Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede. It could have been the Galileo spacecraft, which orbited the system for around eight years. But it probably doesn't matter so much. Just listen to this creepy noise that sounds like screams trying to break through from some hidden place. Without knowing languages, people from different countries won't be able to communicate with one another efficiently. And imagine if some extraterrestrial civilization sent a message to Earth. How would we figure out their intentions? Like, do they want to get to know us better? Or is it a warning about a full-scale intrusion? 
it must be terribly hard to bridge the gap between us and creatures whose minds, bodies, and habitats are totally different from ours. So, to practice decoding potential extraterrestrial messages, an artist-led group created a mock message from stars. It was the most alien missive the world had ever seen. Even though it was written for humans by humans, it was as non-human as possible. The message was sent from Mars to Earth, and three observatories detected the transmission 16 minutes later. Unfortunately, so far, no one has deciphered the message, but many have been trying to do it. There are only three people in the world who know what the message means. One of them is the project's founder, Daniela De Paulis. She and two other co-authors created the message after consulting with scientists, poets, programmers, and philosophers from all over the world. The main challenge for them was to get rid of anthropocentricity to make the message as realistically alien as possible. So the team immediately ruled out any kind of language-based communication. Even though now, they refuse to confirm or deny that the message contains text. The creators were also considering using mathematics. Yes, the fundamental concepts of this science are universal, but different cultures may represent math differently. DePaulis and her team struggled to compose the message for years, experiencing massive writer's block. But eventually, in 2019, the idea was formed. Three years later, in 2022, a major breakthrough occurred when the team drew inspiration from a short story called A Sing in Space. And a month before the transmission, an astronomer joined the team, adding a mathematical touch to the message to make it more universal. Since the first announcement, the project has attracted loads of puzzle lovers. They started to exchange ideas, hoping to solve the mystery. Some of them were among the first people to extract the raw message from the ExoMars orbiter's broadcast. It was a 40 gigabyte string of numbers interwoven with the alien message. If it had been real, it would have arrived unannounced, of course. But in this case, the signal came at a precisely scheduled time. Now imagine peeling layers off an onion. That's what filtering the data segment looked like. But after a week's effort, the enthusiasts received an image of five speckled clusters against a blank background. After that, the speculation on the meaning of this picture started. Could the message be hinting at the alien's appearance? Was it Morse code? Maybe it hid some genetic secrets? One user even enlisted ChatGPT to help decipher the message. There was also a theory that the image was a star map with the location of the alien civilization. Another suggested that the dots resembling constellations could be molecules. Probably, they were part of the biosignature of the foreign world. But decryption is the process of making sense of some message for which only the intended recipient has a key. That's why this kind of code breaking is much more difficult than decoding, because you need to guess the missing key. Another tricky part is where to start. Every attempt feels like a stab in the dark. You might believe that you have started to see patterns, but you need to stop and think whether it's true or you're just projecting. The community is still trying to decode the message. At the moment, there are more than 30 ideas for how to do it. Only after that can people try to understand its full meaning. How about you? Would you like to try and take part in the process? Maybe you've got some idea? Then share them with us. How about going deep, deep into the past? To the times before humans existed, before the infamous asteroid hit Earth, wiping off three-fourths of life forms on the planet, even before the sun ignited or galaxies appeared in the darkness of the cosmos. So, before light could even shine, there was the Big Bang. It happened 13.8 billion years ago. But what was before that? Some scientists are sure that there was no before. Time started ticking as soon as the Big Bang occurred. We're unlikely to ever figure out what reality was like before that, if any. This is beyond human understanding. But there are those who disagree. Some unconventional scientists theorize that just a moment before the Big Bang, all the energy and mass of the nascent universe could be compacted into an insanely dense but still finite speck. Let's imagine it as a seed of a new universe. And this seed, a chunk of essential material, compressed and hidden in a protective shell, was created nowhere else but inside a black hole. Black holes spin incredibly fast, probably close to the speed of light. Such a spin can give the tightly compacted seed 
a ginormous amount of torsion. So the seed isn't just tiny and extra heavy, it's also compressed and twisted, which means that it can suddenly unspring with a big bang. Now, let's say you add up the energy and mass of all the particles the visible universe contains. And then, you try to figure out the answer to the following question. How big could the event horizon of a black hole with the same mass be? The event horizon is the point of no return. Once you cross this invisible line, there's no way back, even for light. But let's get back to our question. Shockingly, such an event horizon would be very close in size to the actual horizon of the observable universe. There's also this idea that became well known thanks to Stephen Hawking. According to it, every time a black hole appears in our universe, it probably gives rise to a baby universe. But you would only be able to visit such a universe if you crossed the event horizon and plunged inside the black hole. And as you know, once you did it, you wouldn't be able to return. In other words, right now, we might be living in a baby universe. But if some outsider is observing us at the moment, our world looks to them like a regular black hole. So in short, there could be a very old mother universe that forged a seed inside a black hole. This seed had its big bounce all those billions of years ago, and as a result, our universe came into existence. But even though since then it has kept growing and expanding, we might still be hidden behind the event horizon of our home black hole. There's also another idea. According to string theory, there's a multiverse of universes. Imagine our universe as a soap bubble. This bubble keeps expanding, and we live on its surface. String theory claims that our bubble isn't unique. There might be other bubbles out there. And all these bubbles move around, collide, sprout, or bud baby bubbles. In short, live their life. If we follow this theory, we might suppose that black holes are one-way doors between universes. And if you accidentally tumbled down the black hole in our home Milky Way galaxy, you'd end up in another universe. Or rather, not you, but what's left of you after falling through the insane weirdness of the black hole. In this case, this second universe wouldn't be inside ours. It would exist separately, and the black hole would merely be the link connecting them, like a shared route between two aspen trees. Whatever the truth, the danger is still there, lurking in the shadows. What if the black hole we live in decides to collapse? What if it pulls us deeper inside? Or if our world is just a bubble among trillions of other bubbles? What if it bursts one day? Our vast universe is home to phenomena such as star-devouring black holes, rapidly rotating pulsars, radiant nebulae birthing stars, and countless galaxies. Yet it may not be endless. There could be a distinct edge, a cosmic boundary. Let's embark on a journey to that possible frontier. Visualize the universe as a massive layered structure. At its core is Earth, enveloped by our solar system, which is in turn housed inside a galaxy within this grand universe. As we journey beyond our solar system, passing by the planets from Mars to Neptune, we encounter the heliosphere. Here, the solar wind's velocity plunges dramatically, giving way to the near-stagnant wind at the heliopause. Beyond, the ship faces the force of the interstellar wind. Two remarkable emissaries from Earth, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, now reside in this region. They revealed the heliosphere's uneven shape. Venturing further, an asteroid belt known as the Oort Cloud becomes visible, believed by some scientists to source Earth-bound comets. Beyond lies the expansive Milky Way, spanning around 106,000 light-years. Guiding our journey is a cosmic map, identifying our location in the Laniakea supercluster. However, there's more. At a greater scale, the Hydra Centaurus supercluster emerges. At the universe's maximum observable scale, a surprising revelation awaits, evidence suggesting a universe boundary. This edge, located an astounding 10 billion light years away, is a testament to time and evolution. During such a lengthy voyage, our sun might wither or explode, and the Milky Way might merge with the Andromeda galaxy. Our endpoint is the Eridanus Supervoid, a vast empty stretch spanning a billion light years. This void might result from an unfathomable collision, our universe meeting another. 
This leads to a tantalizing notion of multiple universes, where every choice leads to alternate outcomes in parallel realities. Imagine our universe as a bubble. Eons ago, another bubble universe brushed against ours. Their gravitational interplay caused cosmic distortions. As they separated, a piece of our universe might have been taken, leading to the creation of the Eridanus Supervoid. Eridanus Supervoid covers a region of space about one billion light years in size. This makes it one of the largest known voids in the universe. The superwave is associated with the so-called cold spot in the cosmic microwave background radiation. The temperature in this spot is lower than the average temperature of the background radiation. The exact origin and nature of Eridanus supervoid is still a subject of research. This object provides scientists with a unique opportunity to study the structure and evolution of the universe on large scales. Yet, perceiving the universe's entirety remains a challenge. Like an ant on a basketball, we see a consistent horizon due to our 3D viewpoint. But adding dimensions could change our perceptions. Could black holes, with their powerful gravitational influence, offer a passage to these other realms? The vast expanse of our universe is filled with intriguing structures, mysteries, and phenomena that continually challenge our understanding of the cosmos. The Eridanus Supervoid, with its immense size and enigmatic nature, stands as a testament to the universe's capacity to astonish and confound us. And for those intrigued by the enigmatic nature of black holes, we invite you to explore more in our other videos. Dive deep into the mysteries of these cosmic giants and join us on a journey of understanding and wonder.